chaos breaks out in California's protests against police brutality and racial profiling sweep the United States for a fourth night. The Twitterati come out against the British Prime Minister with the hashtag Cameron must go, attracting over a million messages in the last week. Also this week, Russia canceled the construction of the South Stream gas pipeline, accusing the EU of deliberately derailing the project. It is 5 p.m. in Moscow. You're watching RT International. I'm Marina Joshi. Now, the U.S. has been engulfed by protests against police brutality and racial profiling. And last night, the situation spiraled out of control in California. <laughs> At least two officers were injured in Berkeley as thousands strong crowd hurled rocks at the local police headquarters. Store windows were smashed by rioters along the route of the march and that sparked a tough response from security forces using tear gas to break up the crowd. The latest surge in the protest was sparked by a court's refusal to indict a white officer who choked an armed black man to death. And it's not just California. Public anger has been gripping cities across the country. Boston, Chicago, Dallas, Los Angeles, and Washington, D.C. have seen major unrest, with streets, highways, and train stations blocked by protesters. Crowds called for justice for the victims and staged so-called die-ins lying on the ground en masse. When do we want justice? When do we want it? Now. Back in July, Eric Garner and an armed black civilian was placed in a chokehold by a New York police officer with a deadly outcome. The man repeatedly told officers he was suffocating but was ignored. The officers had arrested the man for illegally selling cigarettes on the street. His last words, I can't breathe, became a rallying cry for the protest movement. I can't breathe! I can't breathe! I can't breathe! We discussed the situation with a retired Washington, D.C. police officer. He says it's unsurprising that the court decided not to bring the case to trial. New York has uh, law enforcement and the prosecutors in New York have a long history of not bringing charges against people. What we had to realize is that the charges that have been brought against police officers in the past were generally civil rights charges that were brought against them, but not criminal charges. And so I wasn't surprised at all. And it's following a trend that's not only taking place in New York, but across this country, because this is the same situation, the same facts of what we've been confronted with in Ferguson with the Michael Brown shooting. Anger has been fueled by two more recent cases in Arizona. Police mistook a black man for a drug dealer and the bottle of pills in his hand for a gun. So they shot him. And in Hollywood, a man who was killed near the Walk of Fame Police say he was armed with a knife and suspected of assault. But witnesses claimed he was unarmed. Human rights activist Amy Frame says prejudice permeates American society at all levels. You have to, you know, account for the fact that grand juries in cases like this um, have the same, you know, racial attitudes, the same economic, you know, biases that everybody in larger society does. And I think that when the victim is black or a person of color, I think mm -hmm. oftentimes that bias plays a, an important role. There should be criminal penalties for police officers who abuse their power. That should be changed. It's difficult to do. And, I, you know, we want police to be able to do their job. But at the same time, you can't have police officers committing violent acts. And our correspondents are keeping track of the protests in the U.S. from uh, coast to coast. Follow them on Twitter for regular updates as the demonstrations continue to gather momentum. To be in the know, follow us online. Britain's Prime Minister found himself on the wrong end of a stream of Twitter abuse this week. The hashtag Cameron must go attracted almost a million tweets. Kevin Owen discussed the trend with our head of social media, Ivor Crotty.
People call this a, a Twitter heat map. You could consider it a digital mood map. We mm -hmm. like to think of it up in social media echelons. Uh, basically, what you're seeing is the extent to which Cameron must go hashtag is being tweeted by Denzians and citizens of the United Kingdom. But uh, what's been unusual about this hashtag is its strength and its, I guess, its, its longevity. It's to, that's a weak ha uh, trend map that we're looking There's at. There's no right ambiguity now, so. about camera must go, is there? You can't read anything else into that. No, no, but it, it's probably being, being, being run out by you know, some... Mm. Why is it being Labour so popular? Why is it, why is it so popular so there's no ambiguity about it? If people really want camera in gone the majority, or is this just a sort of flash in a pan thing? I think you've got, you've got to look at it in terms of social media strategy, haven't you? I mean, mm. we, we learned an awful lot from the Scottish referendum about what kind of impact social media can have yeah, and how right. important it is to politics. Um, Cameron must go has been drumming, drummed up for about a week now, uh, mm. 10 days perhaps. Kicked off with a huge start, and, uh, but it's been trending, uh, trending at near, near enough to about 800,000 to a million tweets there, thereabouts. Is it going to die so. off now, two weeks in or so? Uh, it's very hard to say, but it, it looks like it's gaining traction. So, what are people actually unhappy about? Well, some complain that Cameron's government puts business interests before the public, and others point to the Prime Minister's pledge to make this the greenest government ever, and only to then ignore fears about shale gas fracking. And some remain convinced Cameron still swoons over media mogul Rupert Murdoch and that he's the one pulling the strings, despite that toxic phone hacking scandal involving his newspapers. Current affairs blogger Joe Edwards doesn't think that the recent Twitter trend bothers David Cameron that much. There's a huge list of things I think that the UK population just aren't happy with at the moment. But we're seeing very little movement so far in the way that we're being ruled. We're seeing people that can bring action on social media that isn't having the impact on the mainstream media. But at the same time, when, it, when we look at people such as David Cameron and the Westminster establishment, we've seen already that they're quite well protected legally. Um, so it, it will remain to be seen whether this is really a threat. But I, I, I think at the moment that Cameron won't be losing any sleep at night. Coming up later, flying over no man's land. Decades after a catastrophic nuclear accident, a filmmaker captures haunting scenes from the abandoned Ukrainian city of Chernobyl. That story in just a few moments. First, in Grozny, the capital of Russia's Chechen Republic, security forces fought off a major terror attack. 14 security officers were killed in the process. Artisan Isanawi looked at the attack and the Western media's response to it in her show, In the Now. Gunmen attacked a checkpoint near Grozny, then occupied a press house building. All of them, 10 people, were killed. 24 bombs were found at the scene. Local authorities say they were planning attacks inside Russia. But no, they are not terrorists, according to the mainstream media. Separatists in Chechnya. Security forces and rebels involved in heavy exchanges of gunfire. Militants in the Republic of Chechnya have attacked police. Separatists, militants, rebels, anything but terrorists. The independent, they've gone even further. Attempting to give background to their readers, the outlet claims those who held several hundred people hostage in a Moscow theater in, in uh, 2002 were not terrorists either. They were just Chechen rebels. More than 100 people died in that terror attack. And in Beslan, it's separatists, rather, not terrorists, who seized a school building with hundreds of children inside. They killed more than 300 people, most of them school kids. And take a look at these pictures. Do you see rebels, separatists, militants? Because I see terrorists who killed innocent people, who killed children, and I've met some of their mothers. I can uh, watch new episodes of Anissa's uh, In the Now here on RT from Monday to Thursday at 7 p.m. GMT. A catastrophe turned the city into a ghost town. Empty streets, abandoned buildings, time frozen by tragedy. And now an American filmmaker has decided to shine new light on the haunting ruins left by the Chernobyl disaster.
Tonight, Artie spoke to the man behind the stunning footage. He told us what uh, shocked him most in Chernobyl. Yeah, you know, there, there are two things that stand out in my mind on, on the trips. One was uh, I, we did manage to gain access to the control room of reactor number four. We were given very little time in there, and I stood in there, and I was taking pictures. And I think within about 30 seconds, it dawned on me where I truly was. The other is walking through the city of Pripyat and the, walking through those buildings and seeing the, the children's toys on the, on the floor, um, seeing that the beds from the rooms where they nap um, really was the most striking. Radiation, the invisible killer, has driven humans from the city. And with no one there, nature has taken over. Trees grow in the city center as vehicles rot in scrap yards near the reactor. The filmmaker wants his footage to allow people to experience the area without it becoming a tourist attraction. The person watching it sort of make up their own mind. They can see what happened there and think, wow, this is horrible, look what man did to Earth. And the same, a different person can look at the same footage and go, wow, this is amazing. Man, you know, destroyed something and nature has taken over. It is sort of becoming a, a tourist destination. I'm hoping that I can sort of satisfy some people's curiosities by being able to show them in, in exquisite detail um, things that they would never be able to see on, on a, you know, a half day bus tour through the, through the zone um, and keep them from going. Well, while some drones are used to film, others are unmanned killers. Later, we report on plans to give the war machines the ability to choose targets themselves and the experts that fear where that could lead. That story and more after a very short break. This is our team, and we're a propaganda bullhorn. Propaganda bullhorn that is the state sponsored Russia Today program. Just words, but that should be enough, right? I don't think yeah. I'm going to analyze this further. That is just ridiculous. Not answer to my question. Uh oh, Johnny's not happy. happy. Our reporters risk their safety and sometimes their lives all over the world to bring people stories non propaganda channels don't want you to see. And we cover both sides. Dramas that can't be ignored. Stories others refuse to notice. Faces changing the world right now. A full picture of today's news. Live, on demand, from around the globe. Rockley.tv Welcome back. This is RT International. This week, Russia axed one of its most ambitious energy projects. The decision on closing the South Stream gas pipeline project is final. It is impossible to implement a project with constant delays and fully fledged blocking by the European Union. And the Western media were quick to seize on the issue, and uh, some claim Putin had declared gas war in Europe, and others called it a massive blow to the Russian president's reputation. But several Eastern European countries raised concerns that they would lose out on cheap energy and end up paying the price for EU policies. The South Stream pipeline was meant to pump natural gas directly to the European Union via the Black Sea, bypassing Ukraine and avoiding transit disputes. The route was supposed to stretch from Russia to Bulgaria, then on to Serbia, Hungary and Slovenia, and ending up in Austria and Italy. With everyone in agreement, construction began exactly three years ago. But relations between the EU and Russia took a downturn earlier this year. And the project all of a sudden no longer complied with European laws. And here's what happened next.
We requested the Bulgarian authorities to suspend uh, the construction of the project uh, until the alleged violations are remedied and we can be certain that there is full compliance uh, with European law. In response, Moscow said that if Europe doesn't need the pipeline, Russia will simply redirect supplies to other markets. Hungary squarely pinned the blame on Brussels, saying the EU knocked itself out to derail the South Stream project. Serbia, which is not even a member of the bloc, says it fell victim to the political crossfire between Russia and the Union. Economist and journalist Willy Mangdahl thinks Europe is losing out. The EU has done a masterful job of shooting themselves in the foot once more. What they do is eliminate a possibility of having secure energy resources, gas resources, over the next period for uh, the southern part of the European Union. The shale gas that Obama promised uh, to the Europeans uh, is a chimera. And now with the uh, collapse of the shale oil uh, business in the United States because of the low uh, oil price, the, uh, that is not even going to become feasible in, in a minuscule amount even to, to the EU. So these are, there are no viable options on the table other than natural gas from Russia. Well, for more reaction on the scrapped South Stream project, you can head to RT.com. Also there, an American journalist and South African aid worker held hostage by Al-Qaeda were killed in a failed rescue raid in Yemen on Saturday. On our website, you'll find an anonymous report on the operation from a Yemeni security official who explains why it ended in disaster. And Polish toy company sees this as a good way to educate children on world history. Kids are now offered the chance to play with soldiers and weaponry with a Nazi theme. What do the customers have to say? Find out at RT.com. Huge crowds of Italians angry at labor reforms join anti-austerity protests in Rome. The action ended in clashes with police. Legislation causing the outrage is aimed at easing unemployment, but protesters claim all it does is make it easier to fire people. Gustavo Piga, an economist at the University of Rome, says the government has long lost touch with people. Italy is obeying what Europe is doing. Europe is asking more and more austerity. It is a demand driven crisis. What has started is a growing uh, discontent in the countries that are suffering from austerity. And uh, this kind of policy that we have right now in the countries uh, where GDP is not growing and unemployment is rising, these policies are not representing the feelings of the people. And there's a disconnect. It's a democratic disconnect. To some other world headlines. And we start in Greece. In the city of Thessaloniki, authorities used tear gas and batons against protesters, marking the sixth anniversary of an unarmed teenager being shot dead by police. Several officers were among the injured when a rally attended by thousands turned violent. A number of arrests were made as well. On Saturday, the capital, Athens, was also rocked by violent clashes. Typhoon Hagapit knocked out power in the coastal provinces of the Philippines on Sunday. It ripped out trees and tin roofs across the region and forced over 650,000 people into shelters. No casualties have been confirmed. However, officials warn the storm's path still lies across three major central islands with some 40 million people in its way. Half a million people braved cold winter temperatures in the heart of Russia's northern capital, St. Petersburg, for a night unlike any other. The walls of the world-famous Hermitage Museum were literally brought to life in front of their eyes in a spectacular light show. It's all part of the celebrations of the museum's 250th birthday. Crowds found themselves right in the middle of grand battles that changed world history and taking in the glamour of sumptuous royal balls. Now, the use of drones is shifting from the battlefield to the playground. Small remote-controlled 
quadrocopters might top this year's must-have Christmas presents list. But while sellers promise the gadget is safe for children's use, RT's Peter Oliver reports that this seemingly innocent toy could be anything but. They may look like a fun child's toy, but the sophisticated technology in modern personal drones is putting more aerial ability into all our hands. Give it a uh, first try to a 14 years old teenage, teenage boy. Honestly, in five minutes, he's doing figures and everything. I'm just, wow. And if even an absolute beginner like myself can get to grips with the basics in just a few minutes, when it comes to the future of drone technology, well, the sky is the limit. Flying at speeds of more than 100 kilometers an hour, able to tower over city landmarks with a range of around two kilometers, even above the clouds where airliners crisscross the skies. This is part of a conversation between air traffic control and a pilot after a near miss between a plane and a drone over the UK. The air traffic controller asks if the pilot knows how far away the model was from him. And from the pilot's point of view, he says it was far too close. Those designing the latest drone say that it's up to the individual to take responsibility for where they fly. It's like having a car. Um, a car has been built to drive on the road, um, not to make accidents or kill people. Unless you have a mind to do so. First up is the Sparrowhawk the world's smallest and cutest killer drone. We built a drone with all the bells and whistles. Posting videos online, groups of drone enthusiasts have come up with various ways to equip them with weapons. The drone cuts down the targets at a venomous pace. It seems inevitable that they're going to be used in ways that the inventors and manufacturers could have never imagined. Potential security risks were brought into focus when an uninvited guest dropped in on German Chancellor Angela Merkel during an event in Dresden last year. But as drone technology becomes more and more easily available, you could find that even in your most personal, private moments, that you're not alone, and in fact you're being snooped on by flying, prying eyes. It's bad enough being caught in your pyjamas. It could be a lot worse, though. The more this technology gets developed, the more there is possibilities it can really go deeper and deeper in our privacy. It is really like a danger that it becomes like a spy technology. We have to find ways how we can somehow scope them into our society. One way to do that is to maybe turn to more old-fashioned ideas to make sure no drone is poking its nose where it shouldn't. Peter Oliver, RT, Germany. Strike drones appeared on the scene just 10 years ago, and now they are an integral part of modern warfare. Later today, RT investigates the inner workings of this highly secretive part of the U.S. war against terrorism and questions its global consequences. The U.S. House of Representatives overwhelmingly passed a resolution condemning Russia's foreign policies. Resolution strongly condemning the actions of the Russian Federation under President Vladimir Putin which has carried out a policy of aggression against neighboring countries aimed at political and economic domination. The language of the non-binding document has been described by some as a return to Cold War-style rhetoric. Former presidential candidate Ron Paul branded it one of the worst pieces of legislation ever. Speaking to RT America, he said lawmakers probably didn't even read the bill before voting for it. It's probably popped up an hour or two before. Probably nobody read it. I went through the whole thing. There's 16 pages of it. And if they read it and still voted for it, there's something wrong with them. Uh, the title of these things and the superficial explanation is, uh, well, we ought to uh, discipline Russia because they're causing so much trouble. And that seems to be the popular thing. And then they go along with it. This was terrible. This is just a very provocative resolution. RT Sky Edge to Count looks at why the U.S. and Russia are once again at each other's throats. President Biden and I have been saying, and that is, we want to reset our relationship. Let's do, it, let's do it together. So we will do it together. Okay? <laughs> In a matter of a few years, U.S.-Russia relations went from this 
Today, the Cold War is over. To President Obama putting Russia in a group with Ebola and ISIS in his ranking of international threats. We're leading and dealing with Ebola in West Africa and in opposing Russia's aggression against Ukraine. How did we get here? In 2011, when Russia did not oppose the UN Security Council resolution to protect civilians in Libya, Moscow did not expect that the NATO operation would result in Colonel Gaddafi's killing. As we came, we saw, <laughs> he died. <laughs> Soon afterward, Russia and the U.S. found themselves at loggerheads over Syria, with Moscow opposing a military intervention. America's interference during the Ukrainian uprising last year seemed to have caught Moscow by surprise. Russia's response to the revolution in Ukraine, in turn, seems to have caught the U.S. by surprise. The tension between the U.S. and Russia peaked. This Thursday, the lower chamber of Congress passed a resolution that many call a declaration of war against Russia. The resolution, among other things, calls to reinforce NATO against Russia, to arm Ukraine, and to export U.S. natural gas to European countries so that they stop buying energy from Russia. Scathing statements and resolutions coming from Washington almost invariably generate a response in Russia. And it's usually not a positive one. And then it's downhill from there. And where this slide will take us is anybody's guess. In Washington, I'm Ganesh Chekhan, RT. In Gaza, a crowd gathered outside the U.N. office to protest the delay in delivery of building materials. And they are needed to rebuild the areas bombarded by Israeli forces this summer. The protest comes in a week. One more European country moved to recognize Palestine. French lawmakers voted in favor, but the decision is non-binding and holds no power. It was condemned by Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu, who said it could stall the peace process. France is just the latest EU nation to make what is merely a symbolic gesture. Sweden was the first major European state to actually officially recognize Palestine back in October. Since then, British, Spanish and Irish lawmakers have expressed their backing in non-binding votes. There's also a handful of other nations preparing to do the same. And we spoke with several experts about why the French made the gesture. The resolution that was passed and the recognition by itself is very much symbolic. Um, I think in the part of European politicians, there is this growing frustration with Israeli policies. And obviously this coupled with um, a collapse, again, of negotiation and the peace process. So there is this, this need for them to, to be perceived as doing something. It seems that Europe, European countries of the EU are obsessed with the idea of creating a, a Palestinian state. One cannot create a Palestinian state without taking into consideration the, inter the security interest of Israel. The conflict is difficult, complex, and it should be solved bi bilaterally, Israel and the Palestinians, not by imposing on us. There is a big problem, it is not understood, not understood absolutely in Europe, and this is very, very bad for them and for us. And that's it for me for now. I'll be back at the top of the hour with more. Don't go away.